as we uh, as we come to worship, we remember that in the presence of of our God is rest. That this day we set aside and make special for for rest and worship. Just hear what the first two verses of Psalm ninety one say. It says, "He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty." I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Mark chapter 8. And we'll start reading at verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law and that he must be killed And after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked, Peter, get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, if anyone would come after me, He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world? yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. Well, we're going to come back to verse 34 and 35 in a little while so this passage open in front of you you'll need it open in front of you because it's a as I said it's a difficult passage these are are hard words for us but such important words as well you need to see that they're coming from the Lord Jesus that they're coming from his word and not from me Mark chapter 8 verse 34 35 he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said if anyone would come after me he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever wants to save his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it my my old pastor has an illustration that helps us to to really get to grips with what the lord jesus is saying here it's about a young man a boy who who wanted to join the army it's what he always wanted to do and so he read military books but that didn't make him a soldier. He played with toy tanks and every stick that he picked up outside instantly became a rifle, but that didn't make him a soldier. He watched parades and would go to Anzac Day and and march along with his chest out and his arms swinging and his back straight, but that didn't make him a soldier. He joined the cadets and he learned how to shoot and he proudly wore his uniform, but that didn't make him a soldier. And then at 16, he left school and walked into an army recruiting station. And he heard what the army could do for him, how it would train him, give him a career, skills, status, and a salary. And he happily signed up. He put his name on the paper. He was a raw recruit, but he was a soldier. He had lots to learn, but he was a soldier. Now, after a few years, a few friends began to talk to him about sin and about his need of a saviour. And he started to read his Bible. And he tried changing his life. He went to church. And he changed his language and his behaviour. He was working hard to be a Christian. But something still wasn't right. There was an uneasiness in his spirit. And so a friend asked him, how did you become a soldier? Was it marching? Or wearing a uniform? Or learning to shoot? He said, no. It was when I heard all the army could offer me and I signed my acceptance of its terms. That's also how you become 
a Christian, the friend said. It's not about doing. It's about believing. It's about relying on what Jesus has already done. The Bible says, and we heard this at a great funeral on Thursday, to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. Well, that's what this soldier did. He knelt down in a quiet place. And he admitted he was a sinner who needed God's mercy. And he asked the Lord Jesus to forgive him. And steadily he saw changes in his life. And he knew that, that inward witness of the Holy Spirit telling him Jesus was his Lord. His sins were forgiven. He determined to go after Jesus, to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow his Savior. He didn't do those things to become a Christian. He did them because he already was a Christian. In verse 34, Jesus is not telling you what you need to do to become a Christian. This is what we do because we belong to Christ. You think nobody irons clothes before washing them. So it is with us. First, we need to be washed from the stains of our sin. We need to be made clean by what Jesus has done for us, dying on the cross, shedding his blood for us. Then the Holy Spirit helps us iron. Then he comes in and shows us where we straighten out our lives, works with us to live a life that honors Jesus and shows him as worthy. Now the Lord Jesus here identifies three hallmarks of the Christian life. And you see, none of them are options. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. And then not just do that one, but maybe not the other one. He must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. There's no wiggle room there. It's not about doing one of the three. And so it's a test for everyone here this morning. Are you really a Christian? Now you think about a paternity test. You can ask that father, is this child yours? And he can say yes, but that's not the answer. It's not until his DNA is taken and compared to the DNA of the child, then you get the answer. And so you will see the answer to this question, are you a real Christian? By taking your life, looking at how you've lived this week, this month, this last year, and comparing it to what Jesus lays out here as the three hallmarks of following him, of being a Christian. Compare your life to Jesus' words. Number one, do you deny yourself? When Buddhists talk about denying themselves, they mean losing your identity, becoming a kind of impersonal blob, becoming one with everything around you. That's not what Jesus means. And he's also not talking about denying yourself things. See, denying yourself isn't abandoning good passions and desires. It doesn't mean hanging up your rifle or your car keys or your crochet hook. For some of you, it might mean that. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Because you can give up all those things and still never deny yourself. There's a man named Henry Theroux who went to live alone in a, a log cabin. He left the city and went into the American wilderness. He denied himself comforts, activities, relationships that he loved. And he wrote a book all about his experience. Why did he do that? Well, he did it for himself. He did it so that people would admire him and buy his books and invite him to dinner parties so that they could hear about his experiences. He wanted the admiration of people as an author and an explorer. He gave up lots of things, but he never denied himself. The Lord Jesus makes his meaning clear in verse 35. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. And so every one of us has a choice. You can live for yourself or you can live for Jesus. You can try holding on to your life. 
Keep yourself as number one, but eventually that will cost you everything because you can't save yourself. You can't buy yourself back from sin and from hell. And so you'll stand before God and you'll say to him, look, I did everything in my power to get into heaven. I did all that I could to save my life. And God will say, but you've lost it. By holding on to it, you've, you've lost it. You've done the one thing that you needed to do to, to lose it. I warned you, you're a sinner. That you're lost without Jesus. That you needed help outside of yourself. Or you can stand before God having given up on self, having lost your life, having given it to Christ, having said, I can't do this by myself, I can't earn my way to heaven, and so I need somebody else to take over. And then when you meet your Creator, well, He'll swing wide the gates of heaven. He'll say, welcome into my eternity. You gave your life to Jesus. And so it is safe with Jesus. This talk of denying self is actually legal language. It means giving up on your rights. Now you think how countercultural that is in a world that, that just loves its rights. Today people are obsessed with their rights. Each week new rights are declared by the UN as human rights. Internet access is a human right. To cut somebody off is to deny them their human rights. Jesus says, my people don't live like this. They've lost their lives. They've given them to me. They've declared themselves dead. And given up any rights that they had when we fled to, to Jesus for forgiveness. We gave up our right to choose how we will live and what we will do. The reality is we never had that freedom anyway because we were bound to sin before we were bound to Christ. But now we've become slaves to Christ, slaves to his righteousness. We're no longer looking to advance ourselves, but Christ's cause. Not clinging to my rights, but living for Christ's right as king. Now what does that look like in real life? There's the theory, what does this look like for us? Well, it looks like John the Baptist, who had these incredible gifts for ministry and preaching and could have made himself the greatest preacher in Galilee, could have taken it by storm, but instead says, Jesus must become greater and I must become less. It looks like a Christian giving up a chance to, to make themselves wealthy and comfortable and, and secure to serve Jesus in an obscure little town somewhere, like Dr. Lloyd-Jones did when he left his surgery to preach in Aberavon. He looks like my old pastor. The last time I saw him, I, I thanked him for his sermons and said, I use them when I'm preparing my own. He said, you use them as much as you want and you don't think about quoting me. He's a respected author. But he wouldn't insist on his right to be acknowledged. His concern is for Christ's glory and for his church. It looks like you, Christians, giving up on activities that are, that are going to take you away from God's word and from his people. It means cutting out on things that, that we want to do but that are going to harm our relationship with God. It's about you willingly looking foolish to speak to someone about Jesus. It's about giving up your precious time and your energy to help a family that needs your assistance as they move on Gypsy Day or when tragedy comes into their lives. Our world is constantly telling you, if you want something, insist on your way. Go and get it. But the first time hallmark of Christianity is that you be totally different. And you say with the Apostle Paul, I've been crucified with Christ. And so it's no longer I that live. It's no longer my way but it's Jesus who lives in me. The second hallmark is that you take up your cross. When Churchill became Prime Minister in 1940, he famously said, I've nothing to offer but blood, toil, sweat, and tears. That perhaps wouldn't be a very successful <laughs> campaign slogan today, would it? 
But he's saying to the people of Britain and to the world, this is how I'm going to win this war. And this is what you can expect if you want to come with me. Jesus said in verse 31, the Son of Man must suffer. He's going to suffer. And now he says, if you're going to follow me, you must suffer too. You see, nobody in this crowd misunderstood what he's saying. When he talks about the cross, he's not talking about temporary inconvenience, but a guarantee of grueling death. A man who took up his cross was not going to be home for supper. He was a dead man walking. Now I want to say that the cross that we carry is different from the thorn in the flesh. They're two different things. There are some sufferings that we experience as a consequence of just being human. They're things that we face because we live in a broken world and so you've got a rude next door neighbor or a hard boss or a, a tongue that gets you into trouble or a physical weakness. People say, oh, you know, it's just, it's my cross to bear. No, it's not. Those difficulties are sanctified to you, Christian. They have a, a meaning that your friend's sufferings don't have. But in their nature, in what they are, they're no different from the challenges your non-Christian friends face. Everyone has hardship, but only Christians carry their cross. It's the suffering that we face purely because we follow Jesus. Hardship that, that we could escape. It's suffering that we could get out of if we just denied our Lord. Suffering we could avoid if we refused to love and obey the Lord Jesus just as Jesus himself could have avoided his cross if he refused to love and obey God. If only he would have said to the Pharisees, I'm sorry, I'm going to stop preaching. If he'd said to Herod, I'll, I'll be your plaything, I'll keep people entertained, I'll be the court jester and keep you marveling at my miracles, just keep me away from Calvary. He could have said to Pilate, I'm an innocent man, I've done nothing wrong and Pilate would have had to act on his behalf, but he didn't. He went to the cross willingly. I know a Middle Eastern man who had to leave his family behind when he became a Christian. That's his cross to carry. Suffering because he loves the Lord Jesus. I've got another friend, Mohsen, who was tortured in Iraq after leaving Islam. Policemen hung him from the roof of a building by his ankles and smashed his kneecaps with a baseball bat. He'll never walk properly again. He was a professional footballer. And now he'll never walk properly again. He'll never play the sport that he loved again. That's part of his cross to carry. Now our crosses are not so rough but they are certainly heavy. And it still hurts us when friends mock and when they don't invite you to things because, well, you go to church on Sunday or when your family treat you like the black sheep because you try and tell them about your Savior. These things will only get worse as you become more like Christ. Pursuing Him means being ready for that mockery, belittlement, and even your death. We can ask the question, well, why on earth would God make this a hallmark of discipleship? Why make this something that Christians are identified by? Well, because taking up our cross is the most powerful way that we can show the world that Christ is worthy. Let me explain what I mean. You think of Nerali's family and the way that they've cared for her so that she could stay at home for the last few months of her life. How they've exhausted themselves caring for their mum. They didn't need to do that. They could have put her in a home and that would have been fine. But the fact that they did that, the fact that they wore themselves out looking after her when they didn't have to, what does that tell you about their attitude, about what they think about their mum? See, Christian, you can refuse to pick up your cross. You can avoid suffering for, for Jesus by being a quiet Christian and keeping your head down. But how does that show Jesus is worthy? 
You see, if your discipleship costs nothing, isn't that exactly what the world is going to think Jesus is worth? You know, I was really struck by this even last night and then again this morning as I was preparing. For us, one of the, the biggest things that puts us off talking to people about the Lord Jesus is the embarrassment factor. It's what are they going to think about us? What are they going to say about us afterwards? But if it's by that suffering that we most powerfully show the world that Jesus is worthy, why are we afraid of it? We're saying I'm going to talk to this person because I love them and I don't want to see them go to hell, but it's going to be a bit scary, so I'm not going to do it. I might end up suffering. But that suffering is what God uses most powerfully to speak to them. And so really we're saying I want to see that person saved, but not that much. That's a big challenge for us. Take up your cross. Thirdly, a passage says, follow Jesus. Deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. I want to turn that two ways. First of all, following Jesus means going in the same direction as Jesus. Christ's people have this new objective in life, this new goal for why we're here. It's the same one that Jesus had when he was on earth and the same one that he has now at the right hand of the Father. God's glory. That's what we're here for. And that's what Christ is all about. It's our final goal and it's the aim of every step along the way. The reason that we live for is to show our Saviour to the world as worthy. And so we live and speak in a way that points people to their need to repent and have faith in Him. That was Jesus' great mission. To show the world God's immense mercy and grace. And so we sang those words earlier. They're a, they're a theme as church that Charles Wesley wrote. Oh, that the world might taste and see the riches of His grace. Because these arms of love that wrap me round, that compass me, would all mankind embrace there's this wideness this depth to God's mercy that desires to see nobody perish and so our goal our lives are lived to that end following Jesus means going the same direction as him but secondly it means walking like him it means copying his example because the road that Jesus walked along is narrow and full of danger and the only way we're going to survive it is if we walk in the same manner as the one who survived it, who walked its full length from start to finish. And so there's an enemy for you to fight along the way. You must be like Jesus then, in resisting temptation, crushing it when it rears its head. Get behind me, Satan. There are people who will try and put you off. And so you must be like the Lord Jesus and treasure what God thinks of you over what man says. There's your own self struggling to get you off the path. Always teasing you, come on, come and have a sit down, have a lie down, take it easy for a while. Less commitment, less involvement in Christ's work. Why don't we take a break and exalt ourselves for a little while rather than deny self? We don't do that. Because Christ didn't do that. We walk in his footsteps, deny ourselves, take up our cross, show him as worthy. This is how we follow. I'm using three main commentaries as I prepare these messages in Mark. One of them has nothing whatsoever to say about the last five verses in this chapter. It stops at verse 33. And perhaps you think, well, if we really want people to follow Jesus, maybe we should leave out this stuff. Maybe we shouldn't tell them about how hard it is to be a Christian. Do you notice the words at the start of verse 34? Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples. See, Jesus has been speaking privately, closely, with his close friends, his close followers. And they've heard how he's going to suffer. But now, when he's going to talk about how his followers need to suffer, he calls everyone in. You all need to hear it, these words about 
trial and challenge and suffering. They're not said in a back room, whispered to a few select people. Come on, we want to leave this out until they're saved. Let's get people saved and then we can tell them about how hard it's really going to be. It's not like that. If you want to become a Christian, you need to know that your life on earth will be marked by self-denial, suffering, and possibly death. And you need to ask yourself in all seriousness, is this really the life I want? You ask that question, but you make sure you ask it with eternity in mind. You weigh it out now. Think about this. On one hand, you can be semi-comfortable because you're never going to be entirely happy here. No matter what you have. You only have to look at the examples of the richest men in the world and you'll see that there's still that desire for more. Still wanting more things. More security. More pleasure. So you can be semi-comfortable in this unstable, broken world of cancer, murder, child abuse, mental illness, anxiety and uncertainty. And then go and be in hell forever. Or... You can suffer for the Lord Jesus. And you can put in the hard yards for the one who suffered for you, who laid down his life to secure your eternal heaven. Which one will it be? Is it worth losing my difficult life on earth to save my soul forever? You see, when we look at our 70, 80 year lives in view of eternity, while well, suddenly denying self, taking up our cross, following Christ, they seem like no sacrifice at all. I'm giving up rags for a robe. I'm coming out of the tent to have a mansion in heaven. So come on. Are you still going to hold on to this world? which is already fading away rather than coming to, clinging to Jesus. Will you still choose things over the treasure of knowing God as your Father and following His Son through this life? Christian, you've heard the hallmarks of discipleship. Things that you must see in your life. Things that must be there if you're truly a follower of Jesus. Do you see them? Denying self, putting Jesus first, taking up your cross, suffering to show Him as worthy. Has there been any of that this week? This month? Following Jesus, living for God's glory, walking like and in the footsteps of your Saviour. Look, if you don't see these things, we, we can talk about that. You come and see me afterwards. We sit down and, and talk about it together. It's such an important question. You don't leave without being certain that you're in the Lord Jesus. But you make sure, if you don't talk to me, and even if you do talk to me, oh, you make sure you talk to Christ about it. You deal with Him this afternoon. You find time to speak to your Savior. Let's do that now.